talk to you this morning about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Luke chapter 15. And I'm actually going to read some from there. I'm maybe going to read a little more than I normally do. I'm not sure what all I'm going to say about this this morning. Um, have had a heaviness all week in regard to this chapter. Boy, there could be a lot of things preached on this morning. Uh, it's tempting to jump off and talk on world conditions this morning. i uh, not going to do that. don't feel like that's for this morning. We do address that from time to time, but I hope you're observant of what's going on around us. I don't think people have any idea how quickly things could melt down in our country, in our world. I don't think people have a clue. Um, people live for now. What can take care of me today? What can satisfy my need this week? What can get me by? And most live very self-centered lives, but there are some incredible things happening around the world, and uh, certainly the signs are in place for the return of Christ. Um, all these are the beginnings of birth pains, the scripture says. So it would be real easy to go that direction this morning, but uh, actually this is very strongly connected to that thought because um, we live in a day where we don't have a lot of time, I don't believe, left, and the call is for the great banquet, the table will be full, and to reach the lost around us. So it is very timely and connected to end times. But Luke chapter 15, if there's ever a chapter that tells the heart of God, I believe that Luke chapter 15 does it. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. If there's ever a chapter that tells the heart of God and who God is, He's shouting something to us in this chapter. And what a shame it is to miss it and not grasp the weight of it. Luke 15, Then drew, then drew near unto Him all the publicans and sinners for to hear Him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this unto them, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth he not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine just persons that need no repentance. We already see in this chapter, God has a different way of looking at things. That's not a very good business principle, do you think? Leave ninety-nine and go look for one. And there's more rejoicing over one than the ninety and nine. That doesn't seem to fit modern day business principles, does it? The heart of God. Verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I've lost the piece that was lost. The coin that was lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And then he said, a certain man had two sons. Notice, a hundred sheep, ten coins, two sons. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto him his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered everything together and took a journey to a far country and wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed swine. And he would have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, no man gave unto him. But when he came to himself, how long does that take? When he came to himself, it takes a lot of patience on God's part for us to come to ourself, come to our senses. How many years has it taken us? 
we were to go around the room and I were to say, my friend, how many years did it take you to come to your senses? And you were to ask me, how many years did it come, take me to come to my senses? It also takes patience to wait on other people to come to their senses. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm not worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. This isn't a story about the prodigal son. If you were to ask most church people what's the name of the story, they would say it's the prodigal son. No, it isn't. It's the story of a compassionate father. The father that watches over the back deck to see if there's a car coming up the drive that he recognizes. The father that looks off in the distance to see the gate, the walk of the son or daughter. Oh, that kind of looks like him. Oh, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. I thought that was them for a second. It's the story of the compassionate father. He arose and came to his father, verse 20, and when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Oh, Christian fathers, watch for your son or daughter. This is what I was going to say last, and I'm saying it first. God is anxious to forgive, it says in Psalms. We model His love. He's anxious to forgive. He ran and kissed Him. What kind of impact would it have had on us over the years if this said, He ran to Him and said, You idiot, you wasted every dime I gave you. Do you realize that I worked 25 years to get that inheritance and gave you half of it and you messed it all up? What would the end of the story be if that's what the Father had said? There's a time for consequences. There's a time to pay the piper. We know that because the Father allowed the Son to get very, very hungry. But when He made the decision to return, what was the father's response? He ran and kissed him and fell on his neck and had compassion. Now the son has his speech all prepared. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Uh, Dad, I, you know, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. You're hugging me and kissing me. I've messed everything up. I, I mean, I, I, I ruined the inheritance. The father said to his servants, bring the best robe, put it on him. Son, he said, you're going to sleep on the back porch till we see how you do. This story is the heart of God and it's the model for us. Didn't know I was going to say all this. Bring forth the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this was my son that was dead, and he's alive, he was lost, and he's found. And they begin to be merry. The elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked, What's this mean? What's going on? And he said, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fat and cat because he received it safe and sound. He was angry. Why are you wasting your time on that boy? Well, I've heard that before. You know what that pastor's doing now? Pam, you remember this? When we went to Chicago, I saw 13, 14 year old girls made up and dressed up like they were 19 or 20 and dressed so sensual it was unbelievable. And they were being sold on the street as white slaves. Receiving no income to support a pimp. Sick, sick, sick. And I said to myself, we've got to do something. And you know what local Christian people in this county said? We had someone say, you heard what they're doing now? Now they're preaching to prostitutes. What will they do next? What is wrong with us? 
He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Shame on you if you've had that attitude. I don't think anybody here does. I don't. And I'm not just trying to be nice to you. But boy, there's a lot of church people this morning. They haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. I'm telling you that Luke 15 is the heart of God. It is the heart of God. This older son said, Lo, these many years I've served thee, and I haven't transgressed against you at any time. But you never have thrown a party for me. But as soon as this thy son has come that has devoured his living with harlots, you've killed the fatted calf. And he said, Son, I want you to notice the compassion here. I'd have been ticked. I'd have dropped the ball big time here. Now, I didn't know I was going to say any of this. But I know what I, I know what my heart's saying. In growth, I'm going to talk to middle-aged and older Christians for, for a second. The rest of them used to listen. I'm going to talk to middle-aged and older Christians for a minute. I think a lot of us do pretty good on this whole lost deal. We, the lost people, they kind of ring our bell. We've walked the Lord long enough, we get it, and we and we but I've had times I was bragging about my maturity and how, boy, boy, I'm, we're reaching out to these runaway kids and these prostitutes and all this. But I didn't have much patience with the older brothers. Anybody else? Anybody else had trouble with that? The older brothers are the people who hung in there and they kind of got an attitude about them and they're ticked off because the lost people are coming in. I've had times I just about raised them. Cut their heads off. But as I matured in the Lord, God showed me that the prodigal son's son story, the father was not only compassionate with the desperate lost boy, but he was compassionate toward the older brother. He said, son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet or right that we should make Mary and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost, is found. You see how he tried to bring the brother along? He didn't get in his face either. I don't have a hand to him. I would. I said, that's about enough. You mean this son comes back from the, from the dead in this horrible life and you're ticked off about it? What kind of prideful attitude is that? That's what I would have said. But the father is so compassionate and the depth of his compassion is of such that he tries to bring him along. He says, can't you see that our son, our brother, he was lost and he's come back. Interesting that he searched diligently for the sheep, swept thoroughly for the coin, but waited for the son to return. Does that seem consistent? Wait a minute. If you went out for the sheep and you swept for the coin, then it seems like you ought to be out for 10 days hunting for the sun. There's a powerful lesson in that. Sometimes we have lostness within the family. Been through this. Parents, it's difficult to wait with a heart of compassion. It's difficult to wait with a heart of compassion. Keep praying. I had a mother that believed I was called to be a minister. I told you, but some haven't heard. Of the day she came out, this will always be etched in my memory. Getting ready to take off on the motorcycle someplace I shouldn't be going. She took a hold of the right front fork of my, of my motorcycle. It's an old 70s chopper. Big long chrome front end. She took a hold of the one fork. And tears were running down her face and she said, you're supposed to be a minister. And I'm praying for you and I'm not going to quit until you are. And then when I started back and made the decision... And without her knowing it, knelt at my fiance's house and prayed at the couch in the middle of the night and said, God, my first prayer wasn't a colorful prayer. It was just, Lord, I'm going to start over if you'll help me. That's all I said. I didn't do the God be merciful for me to sinner thing or anything. All that came later. I just, but I really believe the point of repentance, God knows what you're saying in your heart. And when I knelt at that couch, I said, Lord, if you will help me somehow, this awful mess I'm in, I'm in I'm going to, things are going to turn around. What I meant is I'm sorry. And mom lived up to the prodigal sin story, and so did dad. I went to mom a few weeks later to tell her of numerous things I had lied to her about. Robinses are conniners. 
And boy, I had a bunch of it. And that can be good if it's the right direction, but it can be horrible if it's the wrong direction. I had uncles that were criminals. I went to mom to confess a whole slew of things. And as I mustered up the courage one morning, I'm going to tell her some things. i got to get this off my chest. And I, my voice was probably a little trembly, I don't remember. But I said, Mom, and I stood up in her kitchen, and I said, I need to talk to you about some things. She said, come here a minute. And she walked over to me, and she's only hit me about here. And she put both arms around me, and she said, Honey, I don't want to hear any of them. <laughs> she said, i got a feeling you got a whole bunch of things, but I don't want to hear any of it. And I want to tell you, you are forgiven totally and completely. Ran to meet me. You get me? Well, son, it's going to take 10 years of work to prove yourself to me. And after the 10th year, 11th year, we'll see if you get a second chance. You better be careful. The same measuring stick you use, God will use on you. And you're going to cut everybody off right like this, your days are coming. I'm not making threats to you. I'm just telling you what the Word says. It says with the same measuring stick you use, that's what's going to be used on you. Lost people. A heart of mercy. He waited for the son to come back. When he saw him, he ran to me. Where are you on this? We can paint outreach on the end of the building and put it on a thousand brochures. There's lost in the world. We search diligently for them. There's lost in the church. I think we're weak on that one. I want you to think about those points strongly. Sweeping for the coin, ready to restore. Galatians 6 1. Ready to restore. Lost in the family. Waiting for the son to come back with a heart of compassion. Anxious to forgive. Am I anxious to forgive? Well, they come back, meet my conditions. I want to be anxious to forgive. I often say, if you would observe me on my prayer walk, you'd see me do this. I say, Lord, help me. Let it go. Help me. Let it go. Some of your strongest warriors are people who have fallen. I am not glorifying fall. Don't you dare go out of here. I'm not glorifying fall. Faithfulness is an awesome thing. But we have a tendency, someone comes back, they've been found. We don't have a party for them. We say, no, I'm going to keep you at arm's length. And keep my eye on you. Now it's one thing if they don't repent. And confrontation, that's a whole other thing we need to do as a church. But when a person comes back and they truly are repentant, this keeping a person at arm's length for the rest of their life, that is a scripture. God is about salvage and restoring. Yes, we have to draw the line. Yes, things have to change. But when that happens... I believe a person like that can be powerfully anointed. And you know why? <laughs> because he who has forgiven much, loveth much. I'd rather have an army of young Christians that have been, I don't mean to say swearing sense, been to hell and back. <laughs> and made horrendous mistakes because those people will stick with you. I've been on the street with people working in the street ministry when we'd have drive-by shootings. It's 2 in the morning and... All Hades is breaking loose on the street. And you stop at the street corner and pray. And you say to that person, do you want to go back to the ministry headquarters? No, because I've been where these people are. I want to help some of these people. You see, he who is forgiven much, loveth.